Well, good afternoon. I'm Jim Hewitt, and I'm here to discuss something uh, that's of great interest to me, and, and I hope that you will find some interest in it, too. Um, as I've defined horticulture today, it's, uh, as, as I believe, it's the new agriculture. It's the agriculture of the future, and it's something that uh, we should all be very interested in seeing how this develops as time goes by. Um, just to give you a, a bit of, a, of an overview, um, we're going to look at these issues today. Um, we're gonna start with kind of a dark look at the world's food supply. Um, and we're going to talk about possible solutions to the problems with the food supply. We're gonna look at alternative food production methods will um, help you to uh, define hydroponics, aeroponics, aquaponics, and how do these differ and, and uh, what, are, what are their roles in today's food production. We will uh, travel all around the world without leaving our armchairs and we'll talk about hydroponics all over the world. And then we'll come back good old USA and see what's happening in our country right now with hydroponics. But I don't want to disappoint anyone, but we're not doing this today. We're not talking about how to do this at home, okay? That is the topic of our discussion on May, March 18th. And in that discussion, I'm going to bring this home to you. We're going to start your hydroponic garden at home, and I'll give you instructions on how to do it inside your home or outside your home. We'll uh, provide an outline for you and step-by-step instructions. So if um, hopefully I'm not too disappointed by uh, the outcome of today's presentation, but I just wanted to be clear that we're talking about the industry and the future. What we're talking about today is the master gardener priorities and um, how, how this fits into the priorities that uh, we have established as master gardeners. Uh, we, we think that horticultural skills are important to all of us. We need to all develop our horticultural skills, but we need to share horticultural skills. We need to be teachers. Um, we are taking a particular interest in local food, grow local, eat local, farm to table. How can we do this? How can we change our food supply network and become more local? We're going to look at climate change. And we're going to see how climate change is really affecting the world of food that we must be concerned with. And we're going to talk about clean water because in hydroponics, water is a very, very large issue. Today's world population is about 7.5 billion people. And in just a short 30 years, there's going to be 10 billion people living on the planet. According to Columbia University, our global food demand will increase by 60% over this period. That's a lot of demand. It's interesting to note that the planet must produce as much food in the next 30 years as all of the food that's been used for human consumption over the last 8,000 years. This is an incredible statement, but it's true. Where are we going to produce it all? We, what available land? It's earth. We're not inventing new land, unless, of course, you're in Brazil, but those kinds of things we want to stop. Climate change has had a huge impact on our farmland. According to NASA, 75% of the earth's land has suffered from erosion and water degradation. Pesticides, herbicides, heavy plowing, agricultural techniques have caused the land to degrade a hundred times faster than new soil formation. Land, it's an incredible resource, but we're losing land. We're losing land availability because of things like water, okay? Well, we recently went through a, a large drought in California. Droughts are gonna continue throughout the world because of climate change. Agriculture is responsible for 92% of all the global freshwater use. Interesting to note that our friends in Holland since the year 2000 
have reduced their water dependency by 90%, which I think is ironic for a country that's already 36 feet underwater. Climate change, according to a study at the university or at Columbia University, is going to affect our yields. Now keep in mind, we've got more people to feed, but we're going to have less yield. Corn yields will produce less reduce by 50%. And the reason for that is because of temperature. It's because of land availability and things like CO2, drought, sea level rising, that we will actually decrease our yield production by 2100, by 35%, according to their substantiated studies. So the bottom line here is that we're not producing more food per acre. Worldwide, we're producing less food per acre. And a lot of this has been our own undoing. Oh boy, then we get into this. Pesticides, herbicides, there's over a thousand pesticides being used on the planet today. Many of these pesticides are being used in countries with no regulation on pesticides. And most of our food comes from these countries. With... When you go to the grocery store and you look at the produce and you look at the little labels and you see Oh, it's coming from Mexico. It's coming from Bolivia. It's coming from Chile. Food's coming from all over the world to feed us. And yet we're having more and more dependence on the pesticides to produce more food per acre. Farm to table. Let's think about transportation, trucking food from Chile or Argentina to the United States to feed us. This reduces freshness. We know that even, even shipping tomatoes from Florida reduces freshness. And by the time a lot of this food gets here, it's spoiled. We estimate right now that 30% of our produce never reaches your table because it spoils. We're very fussy. We pick up an apple in the store and if it's got one tiny blemish on it, it's not marketable. It goes to waste. All this trucking adds to greenhouse emissions. And let's talk about pandemic. During COVID-19, the food supply was tremendously interrupted. People weren't able to work on the fields. A lot of the distribution networks were totally tipped upside down. Farms that used to provide to restaurants had no place to produce, they had no place to ship the food. No, grocery stores had shelves that were empty. You saw it. You've never been in stores before with so many empty shelves, but you saw it. A lot of people couldn't go to work. For a lot of people, it was unsafe to go to work. And the food chain would just wasn't the same. We found that there were problems with our food chain and a lot of this has to be resolved. It's an unsustainable food system. And if we're going to have to change if we're gonna survive the world population of 2050, the demand for food is produced going faster than our ability to produce food. Food quality is endangered today by so many of our listed factors that I discussed. But you also think about fossil fuel. Today, gas is cheap. In a year from now, it might not be. It might have a huge effect on production of, and of food. And then of course, there's genetic engineering, that dark area that affects food and affects the food that we eat. So let's think about some options. What are we gonna do? Let's think about eating local. Local sustainable food provides some hope. However, it's very inconsistent. We have very, I guess you haven't been to a farmer's market in a few months if you live in Minnesota. So it's inconsistent. What's the solution here? Well, I hope I haven't created too dark of a picture, but it's a realistic picture. And 
we have to start thinking about how we solve these problems, how we are responsible for what's going to happen in the future. We want to reduce our fossil fuel use. We want to reduce water use. We want to be less dependent on pesticides. We want to have more acceptable plant types that are available to us. We want to fix the climate. And I think a lot of this can be solved through hydroponic food production. Let's talk about hydroponics. Hydroponics is a $1 trillion industry worldwide. It's a huge industry, kind of a sneaky industry too. You don't hear a whole lot about what's going on in the world of hydroponics. But today we're gonna to try to open that door a little bit and tell you what's going on. Let's start with what do we grow? We're all familiar with this guy. We all think about tomatoes when we think about hydroponics. You know, tomatoes are an interesting product. If When hydroponics and first started, I think I visited my first hydroponic farm in would have been 1980, okay? And I'll agree with you. At the time, you probably could have been eating the wax tomato on your dining room table and it tasted about the same. We've adapted through, through plant breeding, not genetic engineering, plant breeding, more, more suitable varieties of plants that grow in, in a hydroponic environment. So today, if you go to the store, for instance, I buy cherry tomatoes called super sweet. They are the sweetest little tomatoes that you'll ever eat. Fresh, good for you, and all grown hydroponically. Green peppers, chili peppers, all kinds of peppers can be grown in hydroponic environments. Believe it or not, broccoli and cabbage products are being grown in hydroponic environments. Corn? Really? Yep. Hydroponic corn is a, a deal. It probably isn't as profitable as tomatoes, but still it's possible. A lot of cucumbers, a lot of melons are being grown in hydroponic farms. Can you believe it? Onions? Yep. The root crops grow well in hydroponic environment. Things like beets, radishes grow in hydroponics. More likely than not, the spinach that you bought in that bag last week came from a hydroponic environment. Swiss chard, you name it, you're going to get it. Strawberries that you don't have to bring from Chile, hmm, that you can have fresh and growing in your locally every day. Just about every herb, just about every herb can grow in a hydroponic environment. Or horseradish, wasabi. An area that I'd like to maybe take a little diversion here and talk about is microgreens. I don't know if any of you have tried microgreens, but um, it's, it does not seem to be as popular or prevalent in our part of the country right now as it is in other parts of the United States. But microgreens can be a, a, a tremendous product on the uh, in your refrigerator uh, and microgreens are basically seed that are that have started growth of just about any variety lettuce cabbage onion garlic melons all these products that i'm listing here can all be microgreens and i'll back up too these aren't sprouts these aren't sprouts okay sprouts are grown in a, a non-lit environment Sprouts have, have a connotation of bacteria and other issues. This is not microgreens, okay? Microgreens are very high in nutrient value. They're very, very rich in flavor, and they can be quite a profitable crop. You can grow my, microgreens at home, and on the 18th, we'll talk about it. Fish, aquaponics, okay? A lot of people are growing tilapia. Maybe that's not your favorite fish, but salmon, shrimp, trout are all being grown profitably in aquaponic facilities. Just about every game fish that you can name is being tried or developed in an aquaponic facility. But right here locally, uh, 
salmon and trout are being grown uh, for market in a profitable manner. Here's the one that you may not be aware of, but this is a big deal, animal fodder. So by taking crops like barley or, or, or oats or wheat and growing almost like a micrograin for animals, we're able to, to feed large quantities of, of develop large quantities of feed for livestock. And there is one farm in, as an example in uh, Wyoming right now, it's a 17 acre greenhouse, not a large greenhouse, but it's producing 700 acres of feed for animals right now. And this is fresh food, it's nutrient dense food, and it's consistent. It's not dependent on the time of year or the weather. Microgreens are being grown extensively around the world, much more so than in the United States. The, uh, the fodder, I mean, animal fodder. Um, animal fodder um, is, is very important through um, uh, desert countries, dry countries. Uh, the Israelis are, are really, really done a lot to develop that industry and India as well. So what we're going to say is let's let's define this a little bit. How are people doing this? They're they're growing all these crops in what we call a hydroponic environment, an aeroponic environment, and an aquaponic environment. So what's the difference? Hydroponics, we'll discuss a little bit here. And hydroponics are definitely are typically the use of, of water in what we call a nutrient film. So if you look at this picture in this greenhouse, all of these PVC tubes are set up and water flows through these tubes, not constantly, but periodically through the day, nutrient dense wa water, okay, where we are controlling the amount of nutrients that go into the water. Anyway, we control the parts per million of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the nutrient and micronutrient, and we know exactly what the plants need to sustain and, and grow quickly. As an example, let's talk about water. In China, statistically, it takes 32 gallons of water to produce one pound of tomato. In the United States, the goal, the, the, the recent Statistics on that say 15.6 gallons and in a hydroponic environment, we produce a pound of tomato on one and a half gallons of water. So we certainly are doing some things to sustain the environment. We'll talk about another form of hydroponics here and it's what we call a Dutch bucket. It's also called a Beto bucket. And in a Beto bucket, it's typically a two and a half to five gallon pail that's filled with, um, um, with uh, a non-soil environment, something like perlite, maybe even vermiculite. And the, the plant is then planted in there and then water drips into that bucket every day and then flows out the bottom back to the reservoir and it filtered and recirculated. Originally, the, it gets the name Dutch bucket because it was developed by the, the in Holland. Uh, for the growth of cut flowers, and uh, and it worked very effectively for cut flowers, but then people adopted it uh, for uh, adapted it, I should say, for for uh, food production. In hydroponics, another way that uh, we produce um, food is what we call the crack key method or the float method, and in this manner, what we do is take a take a material like styrofoam, and we plant the put the plant into the styrofoam and just put it in the water and let it go. Uh, as the water decreases in depth, uh, the, the, the roots are growing deeper. There's not a lot of root growth in hydroponics because if you think of it, the roots aren't having to travel around the soil looking for nutrients and water. All the nutrients and water are right there. So we produce more plant above the, above the ground than below the ground. It'd be unfair not to mention living walls when we talk about hydroponics. 
um, in a living wall, we're, we're not really trying to produce a food crop in a living wall. Uh, we can, it's not hard. It, it's, it's actually a nice way to do it. I do it myself at home. But, but living walls are a hydroponic environment and they're intended for primarily for aesthetics. Uh, if you uh, remember, or if you've been to the US Bank Stadium, uh, Pentair built a huge living wall there. It's very lovely. Um, they even harvested off that living wall for food that was uh, uh, prepared uh, at the US Bank Stadium. I find that Europe is much uh, more attuned into the living wall concept. And yeah, it does have limitations with climate. But uh, for instance, uh, sound barriers in Europe have living walls. And if you think of plants being a, a sound absorption tool, uh, it's very effective, as well as the fact that it's interesting and aesthetically beautiful. So we'll move on from the hydroponic to the aeroponic. And aeroponic is, um, is, is vertical growing, okay, typically. And what it causes is, uh, is a nutrient spray. So instead of water flowing through, what, what actually happens is that the roots are sprayed with nutrients and water. Um, the, not a constant spray, but a, a spray that, that is timed uh, certain periods during the day for a certain amount of time. But, Aeroponics has another option. Uh, a lot of this particular photo is in uh, New York. It's on a rooftop, but there's a lot of uh, chefs that are growing their own food or their own herbs, and they're using it on aeroponic towers such as these. Aeroponic tower, like you could use for yourself, uh, but uh, there's a lot of aeroponics being done on small scales and being done locally. So. I guess as you look at this and you think about it, you go, well, some people are growing inside, some people are growing outside. Well, how should we do this? Well, like without having to get too far into my own opinions on this, um, uh, in a greenhouse, we, we grow our crops with natural light. And of course, a greenhouse requires some property, requires land to do it. And it's typically not in a downtown urban environment, although we'll look at one case where, where we are doing it in a local environment. The initial cost of a greenhouse is high, but it, it does last a long time. Um, but the other way of doing this and is uh, that you read about frequently these days is, is warehouse growing or interior growing. And, that's, and this type of growing is all being done with lights, with LED grow lights. Um, so the cost of the light is high, the cost of keeping the lights on is high, uh, but in, the, in, the, uh, in the, the fact that we can be in an urban environment where, uh, where there's suddenly a lot of availability of property, uh, then this might be a logical direction to go. So um, we, we tend to find that uh, if, if, we're, if we are in New York City, and there's 8 million people uh, that having, no matter what you grow outside of town, it has to get trucked to market. So if we decide we're gonna be growing things in an office building or an abandoned warehouse or even a shopping mall, uh, then that reduces our, 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 our development costs and pretty much focuses our costs on, on lighting and light maintenance. I'm gonna take you for a quick trip around the world. And um, this is just a sampler of what's being done worldwide. But um, in my, uh, my favorite country, uh, the Netherlands, um, Netherlands is the second largest food exporter in the world. Um, I think sometimes you have to read into the, to some of the uh, statistics that, that, that you're given though, because Growing, exporting food out of Netherlands, uh, sending it into Germany or France or Belgium, uh, even England, um, <laughs> is like us uh, shipping lettuce to Wisconsin or Iowa. So it, it, statistically, they become a very large food exporter. But it's interesting to note that uh, this is, Holland is 4% 
of the land area of the United States, 5% of the population of the United States. And yet this little country leads the world in export of potatoes and onions. It's the second largest country in the world in overall vegetable export. And it even has time to lead the world in seed production and seed export. These people are very efficient and, and, and very, very high quality. They understand this world and believe me, they can teach us a lot about how to feed the world in the years going forward. And they do. I visited on several occasions the World Horticultural Research Center and uh, near Delft. And, the, and this research center brings in people from all over the world, from Africa, from India, from Asia, China. They're, they're learning how to do this, how to grow effectively and take these skills back home. Nearby in Denmark, pretty conservative country, now producing 100 tons a year of produce out of their, out of their uh, greenhouses and uh, vertical farms. One new aeroponic facility, vertical farm facility, is, has replaced the need for 2,000 acres of farmland. And remember, we started with our discussion about available land. How are we going to make up for the land that we've lost or the land that we need? 170 acre is equivalent to 2,000 acres. Israel, fantastic research and development going on in Israel. You may be reading lately about new pacts between the Arab world and Israel. Well, most of that's because of food. Israel has developed so much technology in the world of hydroponic and aeroponics. They, uh, and they're, they're now producing all over the Middle East. They're building greenhouses and grow facilities all over the Middle East. The largest actually um, is uh, air, uh, aeroponic facility in the world is in Dubai. Um, what they've done to change the paradigm of supermarkets is, is also very interesting. Years ago, it was quite a novelty when you'd go into a Cub Food store or back then Rainbow Food, and they'd have a little bakery in the store and they'd produce fresh croissants or baked fresh things at the, at the grocery store. And that was quite novel. Today, it's, it's commonplace. But what Israel Israelis are doing is the same thing is they're producing with greenhouses attached to grocery stores and all of that produce is being produced right at the grocery store. And I predict that in the United States over the next 20 to 30 years, you're gonna see the same change here. All of, if we can educate enough people to run these greenhouses, you're gonna be seeing greenhouses in every grocery store in America. Um, Freight Farms, um, interesting story too about Freight Farms is this, this company is actually from Boston, but, they, uh, but they're financed largely by the is, is Israelis and Freight Farms is being distributed all over the world. Uh, you can take an con ocean container, turn it into a food factory, drop it in the middle of the Sahara Desert during a drought and feed people. What a great concept. Singapore is an interesting place. They have taken on a, a, a campaign that 30% of their food is gonna be produced in Singapore by the year 2030. So they call it 30 by 30. In Singapore, 1% of their land area is agricultural. So how are you gonna do that? They're obviously doing it through mass investments in vertical farming. There's 6 million people in Singapore and they're going to produce. They're going to produce enough to feed. Uh, they produce enough for thirty percent of their food requirement by the year twenty thirty. India, great stories in India. Recently, uh, simply fresh, and you can see that up in the photo on the right corner. You may even want to Google them. Simply Fresh is a company that's funded by our local Cargill and also Amazon. 
they had just built a 140 acre greenhouse in India. 70 acres of that is producing medicinal herbs. So turmeric and ginger primarily, uh, these herbs are being uh, grown for medicinal oils and sold pharmaceutically. The other 70% of this is being produced for fresh food. And uh, it's a remarkable facility. Uh, and it's uh, gonna be duplicated again and again and again. In the USA, it's a, this is a $10 billion industry, okay? And it's a mixed industry of warehouse and greenhouse. Now, if you were paying attention to the first time I showed this graph, you will remember that what I said is $1 trillion industry worldwide. And then here I'm saying that the United States, it's a $10 billion industry. So you can probably figure out that we're pretty far behind. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about local production. And these are just examples. There are many, many hydroponic, aeroponic facilities throughout the United States. The largest one is Aero Farms. They're located in New Jersey. Uh, one of the principal uh, investors, a man by the name of Kimball Musk, who uh, probably got some seed money from his brother, but, um, it's a, a 2 million pound annual production facility of greens. The incredible thing is they've built this facility so their grow racks are 80 feet tall. They're producing so much food and, and, and greenery through their farms in, in New Jersey. And they're expanding these farms again right now in California and other places throughout the country. Aero farms, look them up on the internet. They're pretty interesting. Here was, a, here was a, a small market startup by some clever young people with, with a dream that's, that's really taken off for them. It's called Gotham Greens. They built their first one over on the roof of a whole food store in New York City um, and now are located in Chicago and have expanded around New York. The nice thing about Ur Gotham Greens is that it's an urban setting, that they're bringing the food right to the grocery store. Um, they're also growing aquaponics. So not only the greens ending up downstairs on the supermarket shelf, but so are fresh fish. Again, we'll go back to freight farms for just a moment, but uh, freight farms, you can uh, go on their website and you can actually buy one of these containers all outfitted, ready to park in your backyard, plug it in and go to work growing um, aeroponically all by yourself. An interesting uh, side story to this is that um, an acquaintance of mine bought one and he was working, his goal was to uh, produce, produce fresh produce for a uh, small area of St. Paul, uh, an area that, that had needs for uh, fresh food, but also to demonstrate that by doing this in small areas throughout urban areas, that we can reduce a lot of the, uh, uh, the needs for uh, produce uh, being shipped in, and we could also be eating fresh. Um, so he bought the container, parked it in St. Paul, and had to hook up electricity to it, and he had to get a permit to hook up the electricity, and the city of St. Paul wouldn't let him do it. And they said, no, we got, we, We've got laws against hooking up electricity to, to, to trailers. <laughs> and so he was, Saint, the city of St. Paul wouldn't let him hook up the freight. So there's an area over by Surly uh, University that's being developed now, and that's going to be a, a, a small market development. And he, and he called the city of Minneapolis and said, if I move my freight farm over there, and uh, will I have any trouble getting a permit? And they said, stop down, we're writing it up for you right now. So you better be careful where you decide to put your freight farm, but um, it's, it, it's a novel idea. Bushel boy, we all know about bushel boy, don't we? Tomatoes that we eat and eating for years have been growing in Oatana quite successfully. Oatana facility at Bushel boy has just doubled in size. 
and Bush Boy has now just built a 17-acre uh, tomato growing hydroponic facility in Mason City, Iowa. So it's obviously working well, it's locally owned. The side story here is that RAR, the malting company in Shakopee just bought Bush Boy out and, uh, and they're planning to expand this whole facility and concept in, uh, in large numbers. One of the, uh, one of the developers of Bush Boy uh, moved up the road a little bit. And I'm, I, if you drive uh, by uh, Cabela's uh, in Medford, uh, then you probably have seen Revel. Uh, Revel, short for revolution, um, is, is, and I spelt it wrong, but <laughs> uh, just notice that. Uh, Revel is, uh, is a, 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 a float method uh, grow system, uh, highly automated. Uh, even their uh, conveyor belts are, are little water flumes and the water and the and as the plants move around and develop and, and become mature then they move down the down the uh, uh, conveyor areas and into packaging and next day they're in your store and you're buying this in a bag at your grocery store an interesting story about rebel is that they have just um, uh, financed 68 million dollar a development in Texas to grow lettuce, and they will be the largest um, indoor grower of, of lettuce in Texas. But if you're going to be in Texas, you got to be largest, right? So another uh, another fun group to look at is uh, up here in Superior, Wisconsin. You pass by this on the freeway, and and um, you, and it, this is an aeroponic, or, sorry, aquaponic facility. Very, very well managed, uh, excellent production facility, actually doubling their size now too. Uh, it's been um, financed by a uh, family in Wisconsin that uh, manufactures furniture and, uh, and they're doing extremely well. Uh, they're growing um, salmon as well as tilapia and working on the development of many other fish. So, I guess what I'm just going to try to wrap up is, you know, we, we started with kind of a dark story, our story about, you know, where, where we're heading, but I've offered you some solutions uh, to the, to this problem that are, that are being uh, solutions that are being adapted worldwide and that give me great hope. Um, we're not trying to uh, have the world of Wally. Um, we've, we want to do a little bit better before we get there. I, uh, I'm hoping uh, in the, in that this stimulates some interest. I'm hoping that master gardeners themselves can redefine. Um, I think master gardeners need to be aware and educated in this area and that they need to take this discipline and skill set and guide others. Uh, in the in the growth and development and, and use proper use of hydroponics because I, there are so many reasons why hydroponics is going to be an uh, important part of our future. And let me just wrap up with a thought for the day from Megan Week. She said, I came because I love plants, but I realized I cared for the people in the end. I came because I love the earth, but realized that it was the world that mattered. I came because I loved facts but realized it was the emotions that stayed with me. I came because I wanted a job, but I stayed because it was a movement. I've been working in the horticulture industry myself for 40 years, and I've never been so inspired or passionate by anything but the, the movement of today's development in the world of hydroponics. So with that, I thank you for spending the time with me today, and I hope you... Uh, have learned something from this and I hope you have had some inspiration from it and I invite you to join us on the sixth on the 18th sorry where we will talk about methods and uh, the madness of doing this at home thank you <laughs>